That yeah. is exactly where I woke up. Oh, They're singing whoa. It's a Small World, and I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> where are we? Texas, what is good? Thank you so much for coming out to the show. I'm excited to be here in Dallas once again, here for a fun evening talking about a less than fun film. So we are going to make the most of it and we're going to have a fun time trashing this film. I do apologize because we were going to have the show on the 13th. I did have what I would qualify as the greatest excuse ever for postponing the show, which was getting invited to the Percy Jackson premiere at the Met. So I'm sorry. But when it was all happening, I was like, I'm pretty sure everyone will forgive me. So thank you all for coming to the new date. I appreciate that. Sorry to anyone listening that was like, I could have come to the 13th, but now I can't. My apologies. I'll be back. But... That all took place, and then I went through the greatest whiplash possible of going to that premiere and then having to watch the Sea of Monsters movie <laughs> for this show. And unfortunately, when this was originally set up, you all were going to get the first half of the movie, which I would say is fun. Instead, now you're getting the ending of the movie, which I will say is terrible. But to make up for that, there are two incredible guests for this show, so let's bring them out onto the stage, the first of which is someone that you know and you love and I love quite a bit. She's great and everyone likes her more than me and I can't blame any of you. It's my wife, Kelly Schubert! <laughs> hello, hello. Hello, hello. How's it going? Good. 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 <laughs> Short, sweet, to the point. Mm -hmm. Well, let's bring on our second guest, someone who is local to the Dallas area, someone that I have known my entire life, and I'm a big fan of as well. Please make some noise for my sister, Megan Fruhoff. Hello. How's it going? Good. I, I always forget this isn't real money. I got really excited for a second. <laughs> <laughs> it's just pretend. <laughs> so what we like to do when I do these movie episodes is I like to have some person who has read the books and seen the film and then one person who has not read the books and has only seen the film. So Kelly obviously has read them. You have not, Megan. Just as someone who has not read the books, doesn't know anything truly about the Percy Jackson situation, but you have seen The Sea of Monsters, what are your thoughts? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I can't say it gets me excited to read the books. <laughs> well, <laughs> what I will say is the books are the exact opposite of the film. So because you didn't enjoy the film, I believe your text message to me this morning was that dot, 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 was dot, 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 a movie? <laughs> wow, dot, dot, that movie, dot, 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 was a movie is the exact text. I think you should be excited about the books because they are the antithesis of this film. And the TV show as well is also the complete opposite of this. So I will give it a shot. Please do. Please do. But let's talk about this interesting movie. So where we last left our discussion about it, we got to the point in the film where they are in the sea of monsters and they've gotten off of the yacht and all that kind of stuff. And Tyson was steering the ship a little bit with the thermos, the wind was spraying right at the camera because this movie came out in 2013. So everything has to be 3D. So Annabeth to Percy says that she wouldn't trust Tyson with a normal thermos. And Percy says, Tyson's fine. Also, what is your problem with him? Because she's been racist the whole movie. <laughs> Which at this point, you don't know why. No, she's no. Racist. My husband watched it with me and he was just like, whoa, okay. <laughs> <laughs> really doesn't like Cyclops. <laughs> right. So we get a bit of that backstory here. Annabeth, through flashbacks, shows us that she doesn't like Cyclopes because some Cyclopes killed Thalia. In Which, the beginning, they were vague monsters, and now we learn, oh, they're Cyclopes. I mean, I feel like she should have led with that. Like, it's so upon simple. Upon <laughs> first meeting of the half-brother, like, oh my gosh, you can't talk to them. They killed our friend. It's wild that she, rather than, I guess because the movie was trying to make it suspenseful, but 
rather than tell all of her friends the reason why she didn't want Tyson to go on the quest, she just says vague things about Cyclopes being vicious and stuff rather than being like, cite an example. Remember our friend Thali that we're all sad about in this movie, even though she wasn't in the first movie at all? Remember that friend? <laughs> we're so sad about her. She died from a Cyclops. And then maybe it would have more made sense. But she's like, no, I'm going to wait for a dramatic portion in the film. Mm -hmm. And that's when, through the medium of flashbacks, we will show you rather than say it directly. And just a bunch of passive aggressive comments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, yep. Lots yeah. of uncomfortable. Fearly. Yes. <laughs> just I'm just going to tank the vibes so that we can have an <laughs> aha moment far too far into the film. Yeah, yeah. She should have come from a place of fear. Like I fear for my life. My friend died mm -hmm. from one of these monsters. I know you're only a half monster, but you know, fear. Mm -hmm. But instead it was like vague annoyance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It didn't add up. So did you watch the first movie before watching no, it? No. Okay. <laughs> I, I like this. I like, we've had, no. we've had a guest on who watched both and then we've had guests Mike now that have only watched the second. Too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, at the, some of the marketing of this movie was that it was supposed to stand on its own. Yeah. The uh, first movie got such backlash that they tried to say, oh, you can just watch this one on its own. It's okay. <laughs> so I wanted to test and see if that was a thing and it feels like it's not. Well, it kind of was because for the first 10 minutes, Travis and I argued about if I was watching the correct movie. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, this seems like it's the first one. And I was like, but it can't be. They're already out of camp. Like, doesn't he have to discover that he's the son of a god in the first one? What's yeah. funny is okay. in the book, that is a thing where <laughs> the first couple of chapters, you don't know. And it's a mystery. And there's some vague things of like, oh, something happened and it was near a fountain. So maybe water. And then something happens with water. And you're like, okay, probably Poseidon. And then it very clearly he gets claimed. But in the movie, the first one, you just have a conversation opening with Poseidon and Zeus. And like 30 seconds into the film, they're like, your son, Percy Jackson. Like, <laughs> just right away. Just like kills any suspense. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> so... Annabeth has these flashbacks and we get it. And Percy goes, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know. You never told me. But Annabeth says, oh, I don't like talking about it. So instead she will just make snarky comments yeah. for days on end. The weather then suddenly changes and the clouds get dark and ominous. Percy asks what's going on and Annabeth says, it's the sea of monsters. And then looks to the camera and winks. <laughs> Tyson then drops the thermos, and then they are surrounded by what looks like sharks, but it's not sharks. It's a shark lobster. No, so it's just a bunch of teeth. <laughs> and Percy knows that they're not sharks, recognizes that there's something more sinister. So he tells them all to paddle as if he's not the son of Poseidon. Oh yes. my gosh. God of the sea. It yeah. took him way too long to remember that. Yeah. And like, oh wait, I don't need these oars. Like, right. It does track because on the yacht a couple minutes earlier, he does spend a lot of time punching people and then only realizes, oh, right, we're surrounded by water. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess that makes sense for his character in this yeah. movie. But I mean, like, bad move on Luke's part. Like, yes. oh, I'm going to yeah. run away from the son of Poseidon on a boat. Right. <laughs> it does track for the book. In the book, it's a cruise ship instead of a yacht because it has, like, a full army instead of just, like, a gaggle of guys. Mm -hmm. Okay. And <laughs> it's, like their, it's their way of transporting the army of monsters from one place to another rather than just, like, some guys on a yacht hanging out. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but the other thing that is funny because it does kind of track the cruise ship, the Princess Andromeda in the books, it does have on one of the decks a fountain, like a water feature. And then there's another place where there's a pool and Luke does have fights with Percy, always by some sort of water feature. It's like, Luke, come on, man. <laughs> you got you to gotta put two and two together. So what happens is we learn that these teeth are part of Charybdis. And in the Greek myths, Charybdis is supposed to be in a narrow pass, so you have to go in. Instead, they've just like <laughs> happened to be in the one part of the ocean that they're not supposed to be in. So they are getting sucked in. Percy tries to use his powers, but they don't work. And Annabeth's explanation is that the Sea of Monsters is outside of Poseidon's domain which is nothing. That is not true at all. In the books, no. Percy famously uses his water powers a lot in yeah. the Sea of Monsters. Mm -hmm. And like dramatically, it's like this coming of age thing where Percy kind of uses his water powers in the first one, but he doesn't really know what's going on. And then in book two, he really uses his water powers a lot in the Sea of Monsters. But no, I mean, in the movie, it's like, uh-uh, this is different water. So you can't use it. <laughs> Which doesn't make any sense anyway. No. It's still water. Right. No, oh, but it's outside of his domain. So... <laughs> <laughs> 
So they get sucked inside of Charybdis. They are okay, though. They're in the stomach. Percy somehow knows that everything that gets lost in the Bermuda Triangle ends up here, even though he was not in the room when Mr. D explained this to Grover and Annabeth. But Mm -hmm. he just knows this. They've never talked about this. I'm wondering if Amelia Earhart's going to show up, but she doesn't, sadly. (laughs) Annabeth then thinks that she hears Clarice. Percy doesn't think so. But then Clarice calls people stupid morons, and then he and Annabeth go, it's her, which is kind of funny. Like, there are some rare jokes in the film. (laughs) But then they kind of get her attention. She brings them onto the ship, and the ship does feel accurate enough to Mm -hmm. the ship that they use in the book. Clarice points out that the ship is about to get digested, and I don't really know a whole lot about monster body parts and biology, but it feels like there's a second monster inside of the monster that's yeah, just like- With the, more teeth. Yeah, yeah, it's just like, well, I'm the digestion monster yeah. inside the <laughs> other monster. He swallowed that monster at some point. Yeah, I guess. And that's like, you live in my stomach now and yeah. you chew up my food for me. <laughs> so then Clarice calls out to her first mate, Reardon, to explain what's wrong with the engine. Now, this is- strangely, a nod to the author Rick Riordan, who wrote the book. But it's a mispronunciation of his last name, I guess because it would be too on the nose if the character was named Riordan and not Reardon. Was it an intentional thing? I feel like it. Why else would you do it? There's no character in the book called Reardon. And I feel like this whole movie is just them trying to appease the fans by putting Easter eggs all over the place (laughs) that make no sense at all. So they were like, ah, I know what'll get the fans back on board. We invent a new character and name him after the author who famously hated the first movie so much that he left production, sent nasty emails to Chris Columbus and the production team, and then posted them on his website for the world to see, and also has an FAQ page where the first answer at the time was, I had nothing to do with the movies. That'll get the fans on board. We'll name a zombie after him. I feel like they would have named him Rick. The zombie would be Rick if they were naming it after him. I feel like whoever decided this thought it was the most clever thing in the world. They're like, guys, 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 I've got it. Check this out. So, They have the first mate zombie reared in. He explains what's going on with the engine. Annabeth is shocked that they have a zombie crew. And we get another, like, politically correct joke in this movie, which is just so tired and boring. But it's another, they prefer to be called the undead zombie crew of, you know, Ares defeated warship or whatever. Mm -hmm. Just like this and the ocularly impaired thing that keeps coming up is just like... Oh my gosh, great. It's like what all the like 65-year-old white dude comedians thinks are jokes. They're like, I have to learn what a pronoun is. Jesus Christ. (laughs) So Clarice's strategy is let's just shoot the digestion monster. And Percy suggests, how about instead of just shooting the digestion monster and getting pooped out, we shoot a hole in the stomach wall and then we can just leave through the stomach wall. And then he does say a cool line that you pointed out that Travis did not like. (laughs) Something to the effect of like, you better watch what you eat or something. (laughs) What is funny though is- He just noted that it was super (laughs) corny. It's quite cheesy. What's unfortunate about it though, what's funny is like, they're turning the gun one way, like it was facing forward and the digestion monster was behind them. So they turn it one way to try to shoot behind them. And then Percy's like, no, 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 let's do the other thing. Rather than just like bring it back a little bit and shoot out this wall of the monster, they do like a full 180 to shoot out the other wall of the monster. It's like, does it really matter which side of the (laughs) stomach we open the hole in? It just takes so much more time. No, I said the first time I watched this movie was on the live stream with you, mm -hmm. but in the other room, not on the live stream. And I fell asleep for about 10 minutes. Okay. This is the 10 minutes I was asleep the first time. Oh, okay. And you wake up and it sucks on the other end. Up until this point, it's been kind of funny, lighthearted. We get some Nathan Fillion. We get some interesting Tucci action, Mm -hmm. some fun jokes. This was the bit where they got swallowed and then I fell asleep. And then I wake up to like what's about to happen next in uh-huh. in Cersei land. So, I mean, I have watched this since then. I went back and watched the 10 minutes so I would know what was happening. But at the time, it was just, I go to sleep on a fun movie. I wake up and it makes no sense at all. Yeah, it gets <laughs> interesting. Not only is it interesting that they are inside of the stomach and they're yeah. okay and there's no acid, but apparently this boat just is a submarine now. And they shoot holes into the wall. They tell everyone to get below deck. And then they just are able to 
drive out of it and then somehow just rise. Like there's no notion or mention of how they get up there. The cheap glass like is cracked, but no water is going in, Mm -hmm. even though they are certainly well deep enough for the pressure to break through a broken window. Yeah, I I thought they got shot out through a blowhole because I was asleep during no. this bit. Like, I thought they went, like... It's just Finding Nemo. Yeah, I thought it was funny. I was like, this has been done before. <laughs> so the boat is a submarine now. It's okay. It rises to the surface. And then when they are on the surface, they start to talk a little bit more. Tyson asks, hey, where's our good friend Iknute, the buff <laughs> satyr? Not in the books at all. They just invented a guy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. I've no, never heard of him. <laughs> absolutely. No, and neither has anyone here. <laughs> but what's weird is that they invent this character who, I don't know, he seemed fine. He was excited about Clarice. He was excited about going on the quest. His muscles looked good. But then Clarice mocks his death instantly. Tyson asks where he is, and Clarice is like, oh. We ran into Skilla, and he said, I got this. Like, even doing an impression of a recently deceased friend. <laughs> well, to be fair, no one ever stays dead in this movie. Yeah, so, like, he could come back. Is it, is it really a thing? <laughs> Does it matter? Well, let's see if he comes back in the third movie that's never made what coming out. What is dead may never die. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently, Ignute said, I got this to try and defeat Scylla, and apparently, Clary says, those were his famous last words. Scylla is a monster that does show up in the book. Scylla and Charybdis are supposed to be like a combo act. Like they're supposed to be together to make you forced to face death and doom from one of them. But they are just like separate different things that you can run into the sea of monsters. So that happened to Iknute. We all shed many, many tears. It was a big (laughs) Lee Fletcher situation. So then... Percy's coordinate powers kick in. And (laughs) (laughs) this is something that does. I mean, this is like the most unbelievable part. Mm -hmm. Like, all of a sudden he's like, oh, wait a minute. I can read latitude and longitude and perfect numerical. Like, it's just spelled out for me. Wait, these are the numbers that the weird taxi people told me about. Yeah, it it gets wild. So in the book, it is a thing where the taxi people say the number, he holds their eyeball hostage and they say the numbers and he's trying to figure it out. And then basically along the way, he just kind of like all of a sudden recognizes, like, I know what these numbers mean. There's no thing where he can see it. He just like gets it. And he asks Annabeth, like, why do I know what the numbers mean? She's like, your dad is Poseidon. That's why you know. He's like, oh, okay, okay. And then they use it to go to the Bermuda Triangle. But in this... He says, because I guess they haven't mentioned it in this movie yet. and No, it not. It came out of way left well, field. Well, they mentioned the dyslexia thing, which, like, is an important thing in the story. So when Rick Riordan wrote these books, they started as bedtime stories for his son, who has ADHD and dyslexia. So he decided, I'm going to tell a story where the main hero has these things, and then it'll just be cool, and my son will feel empowered. Yeah. And it's this whole sweet thing. And then in the books, it becomes an important thing where it's like, oh, your ADHD is actually your battle senses. And your dyslexia is because your brain is hardwired to read ancient Greek. So it's trying to like explain that these things are something that all demigods deal with. But they're still heroes and it's okay. And, you know, you're not wrong. You're just different. And it's really cool. Yeah. In the first movie, they kind of bring it up and it's not done super well, but not done horribly. But then in this movie, it just never comes up at all. <laughs> The ADHD and the dyslexia aren't mentioned, except for this one almost throwaway line where Percy can just see all the latitude and longitude, and he's like, it's kind of like my dyslexia, but instead, I know where we are in the ocean. (laughs) Okay. Completely unrelated. And also, not to nitpick too much, but those latitude and longitude lines are way too close together. They are so (laughs) close together. (laughs) So he has this magical power, but... When you think this is already wild enough, somehow the Grey Sisters, the evil cab drivers, know that he knows as if they have an empathy link brain connection together. How do they know that he knows? This was the most surprising thing to me out of anything. Really? It, like, why? They have, like, how would they know? They have, Don't they have like an all-seeing eye? Yeah. But does the all-seeing eye like I think know? it sees past, present, and future depending on which one of them is wearing it, right? Isn't that like a... Okay, yeah. I don't know. I guess this didn't happen in the book at all, so it just felt, I don't know. No, that's just, like just, no, a, it's that's just like a real ancient tale. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah okay, yeah, right. Yeah. It's just proper mythology, I mean, not that's, whatever's that's happening in this movie. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not calling on anything we know from the movie. 
yeah. just from things that I think I know from Hercules the animated movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess I guess in my mind they all seeing I was like they could tune into stuff, but maybe they were just patiently they're still driving. So they're just driving around being like, When's he gonna figure it out? When's he gonna figure it out? When's he gonna figure it out? <laughs> it's also a crystal ball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so then I guess they do figure it out. And he can see everything, and he realizes that they are going to go the wrong direction. And what's wild about this is, I believe the coordinates in the book, it's just like used for them to know where the Sea of Monsters is. Mm -hmm. But the weird thing in the movie, they're already in the Sea of Monsters because the weather changed. They are already <laughs> inside the Sea of Monsters, but now the coordinates are pointing to Cersei land. But the reason that doesn't make any sense is like, they know the general direction that they need to head in. And Clarice tells them to go in one direction. And then Percy's like, no, no, no. You're not pointed that direction. We're pointed another direction. You didn't need Percy's magical powers. You just need a compass <laughs> yeah. to know that you're not going southwest or whatever direction you're trying to go. Yeah. Like, he does this whole big thing, and it accomplishes nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. Yep, he, it she is. really needs a better crew. <laughs> they just need one compass. And what's wild, as we'll see later in the movie, Clarice has a smartphone the whole time <laughs> that never gets used. I know for a fact that there that was thing, no service. No, was I, no guess. service. I, was say, I know for a fact that thing has a compass app on it. Yeah. That was one of the OG Apple apps when I had an iPod Touch because I didn't get a smartphone until my senior year of college. <laughs> I knew that that would have been oh, God ridiculous. So. <laughs> One more thing about sure, her crew. Sure, please, please. Crew. I could go to, on forever. Just to keep going on, back to this. They're in a, a Confederate warship, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Did I get you to watch the wonderful 2010s Sahara movie with me starring Matthew McConaughey? Everything except for the word <laughs> wonderful was correct. <laughs> wonderful movie, Sahara. I believe it has like a 13 on Rotten that Tomatoes. That movie is like, great. It's not. Awesome. <laughs> I promise it's not. But the whole time they're searching for a Confederate warship. Correct. That disappeared because it like went kind of underwater and i was thinking when you it were just like a submarine it kind of became like semi -submarine. They were not invented yet <laughs> so no. i think that like it could survive under conditions like that according to sahara according and to the reputable yeah. <laughs> source material of sahara it also Matthew ended up in the sahara desert by accident right not famously sure lots of water in that general mm -hmm. area well it dried up that's how oh, it ended up there yeah that's where mm -hmm. all the treasure was so right. there's no it's a great movie. Everybody should it's not. It. I can't unrecommend it enough. <laughs> I would love one of those multiverse, like when the Super Carlin Bros do the thing where they're like, every single Pixar movie is linked. If you look at all these things, I would love one that's like Sahara and Percy Jackson. They are. Sea of Monsters <laughs> actually exist in the same universe. Welcome to my podcast. The Matthew McConaughey, <laughs> Percy Jackson story. There's one episode and it's just about this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so they change course. Reardon, after being instructed to change course, says, I, I, and then looks at Tyson and goes, sorry, because we really have to drive home that he is in fact a cyclops i didn't get that joke at all when he said I, it i didn't realize he was making fun of him i don't think no, he, not, he said to? i twice and he's like oh, oh you only got one of those okay sorry about that but gosh. it's terrible it's terrible it's so ridiculous annabeth then looks longingly at the withering branch that she still has <laughs> wrapped up in her jacket like it's the photo from Back to the Future. <laughs> and it's saying how good things are going on the quest, which is not good, even though it's just not connected to a tree. That's why it's not looking good. But <laughs> she looks wistfully as the really bad CGI, the <laughs> needles just kind of fade off into the distance. And like, some of the CGI in this movie is fine. Some of it is bad. Was it so hard to get like a real <laughs> pine branch and just like, I don't know, loosely, I feel like you yeah. could have done this with no, a physical prop yeah. and then just like somehow attach things loosely and then just hit it with like a blow dryer. I don't know. I feel like it wouldn't have been, <laughs> yeah. surely it would have been more time and effort and money for the CGI team to make this whole thing yeah. than it would be for her just to like hold a stick yeah. and then then blow some twigs. It's kind of like she's walking around with her friend's lock of hair or fingernail in her pocket <laughs> or something. It's weird. Oh, it's so gross. <laughs> it's so gross. So... They change course, and now they arrive at Cersei Land. Now, Cersei Land, Megan, don't worry. Not a thing in the books. Not a thing. Are you familiar? You mean there's not an amusement park that they just, like, are like, oh, this looks like it hasn't operated in 
a long time, but let's go on this roller coaster together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this seems like a good idea. It's, it's this weird combination of a thing that does happen in the first book where they have to retrieve Ares' <laughs> shield from a defunct water park and – Cersei does exist in the Sea of Monsters book, and it's pretty similar to, like, the classical myth where they are, you know, welcomed in and tricked to come on shore, and it seems like everything's going to be great, but then they turn Percy into a guinea pig. In the Cersei myth, she turns men into actual pigs, so there's kind of a joke there, and it pretty closely follows the actual mythology. But instead, in this movie, what they do is they're like, let's take Cersei, not put her in at all, <laughs> not make anything similar at all, whether it's to the book or to the actual mythology, let's combine it with the water park from the <laughs> first book, a scene that we didn't have in the first movie, but the fans really want Waterland to show up. So let's combine Cersei with Waterland to make Cersei land. But then they have to introduce all of this, and then Tyson has to exposition dump on the boat why it's not a thing. So we learn about it being a thing. And then Tyson has to do like his longest speech of the film. It's him explaining to the audience why Cersei Land is a defunct, beaten, not used, abandoned amusement park. When in the actual book, Polyphemus just lives on an island. Yeah. So they could have just had Polyphemus on an island. <laughs> but instead they were like, Let's bring in two other things from the book, but not really. And now we have- <laughs> from a different book. <laughs> yes. Now we have Cersei Land. It's so ridiculous. But his explanation is that Cersei wanted to build a theme park on Polyphemus's island. Why did she want to build a theme park? We'll never know. Why did she choose <laughs> Polyphemus's island? We'll also never know. But she chose these two things. And then I think Percy asks Tyson, what happened to it? He goes, oh- well, opening day, there's a bunch of demigods in long lines and then a very hungry Cyclops. Bad for business. Like, no one. No one. What about all the people who were there building the rides this whole time? I guess they weren't demigods, so he didn't want to eat them because Polyphemus only wants to eat demigods, according to them. But that doesn't make any sense because once we get to the island, Polyphemus is hell-bent on wanting to eat satyrs, which is more accurate. Like, the actual myth of Polyphemus, mm -hmm. which does hold true to the Sea of Monsters book, is that he's got the fleece, and it makes his island all magical and wonderful and keeps his sheep healthy and everything. Mm -hmm. And then satyrs are drawn to it because they think it's Pan, the god of the wild. But instead, it's the fleece, and then Polyphemus eats them. And he's like, this is great. Free food all the time. Free delivery. I don't have to pay a bunch of fees and stuff. <laughs> My tips are probably going directly to the drivers. But... <laughs> Instead, he just is here on Cersei land and he decides to stay. I j it's just. Uh. Do you think that they were hoping that Cersei land was going to go over so well with the fans that some amusement park was going to want to buy the rights? Oh, my God. To oh, my land. God. <laughs> I don't turn it think into so. a theme park. I feel like what it probably was because of all the sets that they have in the movie, they really don't like have that many set pieces. They've got the camp, they've got the yacht, they've got. DC, which might have actually been real or just like shot somewhere. I don't, think it, was, I don't yeah. think it was actually DC. <laughs> and then they got the set that's the brig, and then they have the boat, and then that's like mostly CGI all around them. And mm -hmm. then they have Cersei Land, which is like mostly made of like physical things. I feel like the movie production team just like had access to a theme park set, like somewhere wherever they mm. were filming it. Like if it was, I don't know, like with Universal Studios or whatever the heck it is, like mm -hmm. Fox's studios that they have somewhere i bet they just like had a broken down theme park from some other movie and they're like you guys can just use this we're not using it and they're like write it into the script we got to save money because <laughs> budget cuts are pretty clear so i feel like it was just a cost saving move. well you know what else is cost savings just using open nature no i don't know down, like an island I don't know. somewhere <laughs> i don't know i don't know about that yeah why didn't they just like fly up to new zealand to take the lord of the rings approach yeah, and be yeah. like oh <laughs> it's ridiculous yeah they could have just gone to a park but instead <laughs> Cersei land. Yay. The crowd goes wild. <laughs> so they arrive at Cersei land. Reardon is scared to get to Cersei land, which doesn't make any sense because he's a zombie. So he's mm -hmm. dead. So why does he think Polyphemus is going to eat him? Yep. And even if he did, the whole myth of the undead warriors still helping Ares is that like they can't die. So they keep helping Ares when he needs missions mm -hmm. and stuff. So what is he afraid of? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
So Clarice still wants to move forward, doesn't care if Reardon is scared. So they get to Cersei land and they're not really sure where Polyphemus is. But then as they're going around, Percy sees the plummet of death ride. And he's like, that's gotta be where he is. And I kind of side with Clarice who's like, I don't know why he would be there. <laughs> like it's not anything particularly Cyclops-ish, but then they hear a really loud yell coming from inside. So then they're like, okay, let's go on in. So they decide to go in, they get on the ride, which somehow still operates. That's the most shocking part. Yeah. Oh, and that they were just like, oh yeah, let's just get on it. Yeah. Like, it looks fine. What's Yes, and, and it's strange because like the way it goes, and it could be you could say like, oh, it was just moving. It wasn't like electronically powered, but I do think some of the lights on the inside were on. So I don't and know if like, like Polyphemus- The track could have been missing. Like right? it's like a, just yeah. a total roll of the dice here. Yeah, and it's not just a track like a kids ride at Disney or something where it's just like on the ground. Like this track goes over caverns. We see later, like there's a huge drop that it goes over and they're just like completely trusting that this defunct, abandoned ride is going to be totally fine and nothing's going to break. Like, it feels like, yeah, you can go along the tracks, but why would you get in and then harness yourself in? How do you know you're going to be able to unharness yourselves? It's the Green God scene. Yeah, where, yeah, that's what this yeah, is. It's the yeah. Green God scene part two. They're like, that worked. Let's do it again. Did you catch that this movie was directed by the same guy who directed the first two Harry Potter movies? Well, I just heard you say it, that it was Christopher Columbus. Mm -hmm. So what was directed first? Oh, Harry Potter. Yeah, okay. By, so the Harry Potter movies started coming out like in the early, mid-2000s, and then these were like 2010 and 2013. Mm -hmm. So okay. the first one, there's like tons of Harry Potter bleed over where it just feels exceedingly like he was just doing the same stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then this one, there's still some things where it's like, ah, oh, the taxi cab is just the night bus combined with the Ford Anglia, yeah. sure. <laughs> and then this yeah. is Gringotts. Yeah. But he doesn't, he's not, he didn't do the night bus. No, but I'm sure he saw it and was like, oh, man, that was pretty cool. Yeah, he's like, oh, I should have done that. <laughs> I should have put, put that one in the second. What yeah. was I doing? And he's like, that I mean, worked out so well. Let's I, try it again. I feel like the first two Harry Potter movies are the corniest, but I mean, yeah. they're younger. Right, but they're but, fine. But like, this is a downgrade from that. Oh, and it's, it's later huge, in his career. Oh, it's a yeah. huge yeah. downgrade. And what's right. wild is the complaint that some people have that I said when I was talking about it on Potter is like, the first two Harry Potter movies are almost like too true to the book. Like, they're just like really doing everything beat for beat and it feels like a bit stale at times. And then mm. on the flip side, Chris Columbus in these movies is like, what if I just like hit up some Chris Columbus originals, baby? Like, let's just. <laughs> 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 so they get in the ride. It somehow still moves. Annabeth and Percy sing It's a Small World oh while gosh. they're on it, which oh my is gosh. like, it's <laughs> kind of funny. I, mean, oh. I feel like Disney's going to carry that over, though. Disney. It might be the only thing that they keep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to see if they get on a ride. But, yeah, I mean, in the TV show, they are going to go to Waterworld. We'll see if they make any sort of Disney reference now that I mean, it is a that Disney That would be show. more accurate yes. since it's actually a water ride anyway. Yeah, that's true. We'll see. Tune in to episode five. <laughs> so I had blocked that out. That yeah. is exactly where I woke up. Oh, They're singing whoa. It's a Small World. And I'm like... <laughs> What? <laughs> Where are we? <laughs> it is. What's interesting about it is that it is a funny joke, but because Percy and Annabeth, I mean, like, it's fine. Like, it's kind of funny. It's a thing, like, Percy in the books is often cracking jokes, which does not happen in the film. But he's, like, cracking jokes left and right. And some of them are funny, and some of them are duds. And I think that's part of the joy of him being a teenage boy. Mm -hmm. he's, he's younger in the books as well. Like, he's supposed to be... 12 to 16 over the course of the books. Okay. So not every joke he has is good. He tries to like taunt the monsters he's fighting and sometimes it's good <laughs> and sometimes it's not funny at all. I like him doing this sort of joke, yes. but because him and Annabeth are so exceedingly unfunny in this movie <laughs> and in the previous movie, when they told a joke, I was so like taken aback. I was like, this doesn't feel accurate to the <laughs> Percy and Annabeth that have been established in this film. Like these characters are not funny. Why are they making a joke? Well, I don't think Annabeth would have sung with Percy. No, That's book Annabeth like. would not book have Annabeth for sure. Would have Percy would have been singing, and Book Annabeth would have looked over him with a real quizzical kind of look. Right. And she would not have joined in. That was the bit that I was just like, you've taken every bit of Annabeth out of this character. Mm -hmm. You just turned her into whoever she's talking to at the moment. That is true. I think you're right. Annabeth yeah. doesn't have any personality. It's just, who is she talking to? That's mm -hmm. how she acts. And it's like, oh, Percy? Vaguely like him, I guess. Clarice, don't like her. Tyson, racism. Like, yeah. It's just... 
<laughs> that's just that's what it is. She's like yeah. a like a ditto that just like changes based yeah. on whoever she's talking to. And she just gives Luke confused looks. <laughs> yeah. Well, because that's a, that's another thing that they failed oh to establish gosh. in the first movie. Annabeth and Luke are supposed to have this big backstory. And you kind of see that in the intro. Like, they went into camp together. They're supposed to have, like, this very complicated relationship. And it's just, like, not touched upon at all in the first movie. And then in this one, they're like, oh, we got to kind of bring this in. Let's have Luke hit on her. That'll do it, right? That was weird because he uh-huh. was like, hey, cousin, yep. looking good. And I'm like, yep. what? Is <laughs> yeah. this Game of Thrones? Uh-huh. Like, where are we? Yeah. And me and Megan don't have any first cousins, but we still know <laughs> that's weird. weird. <laughs> <laughs> like, we don't have to have them to know you don't go, hey, cousin, what's up? <laughs> At least not back to back. Like, yeah. uh, come on. <laughs> Have a couple lines in between so we forget your cousin. <laughs> right? Exactly. Exactly. So they sing It's a Small World. I did want to ask you, Megan. I'm glad you're the guest. The stars often align when I have guests on the show. You famously, as our parents will often tell embarrassing stories about us as they are one to do, you went on It's a Small World, I believe, 17 times in a row. On I mean, one of that's, your Disney trips? that's the story I've been told. <laughs> <laughs> How did you feel when there was a It's a Small World reference? Were you excited to see your favorite ride be mentioned? Always, always. <laughs> but that's why I'm convinced that that'll be the only thing that Disney keeps. Or are they you, should, if are, they're going to keep anything. Sure. Are you still a fan of It's a Small World? Have you taken... Oh, absolutely. Okay. How many times did Aurora want to go on? Was she as big of a fan? Did you beat your high score with her? <laughs> no, no. Okay. We didn't go as many times in a row. I mean, the lines are a lot longer now. <laughs> um, but I, we took her on... When she was really young, like one and a half, we took her on in Disneyland, which we've taken her on both. But Disneyland is a little different because they have the princesses in each of the lands. Like they have an animatronic that's the princess for each country of the origin story. Oh, okay. So like there's an Ariel in Greece and there's, you know, uh, Jasmine's on the flying carpet in Arabia. Yeah, it's supposed to be, I think. Oh, okay. I don't know. The new one, they're like in the Caribbean, so. Okay. I had no anyway, idea. Yeah, I don't yeah, know. I don't know. <laughs> it would at least make Sebastian anyway, make so, sense. Yeah. <laughs> she did, this was like the first ride she's ever been on. She does not know what to expect. We're in the boat. All of a sudden, we're going in a tunnel. She freaks out. And Travis, my husband's like videotaping her reaction. So at first, she's like buried into me. And then she hears the music and she peeks and she starts to kind of hum to a tune she's never heard before. (laughs) Starts humming along and then points out every single princess that she sees and we're like instant hit. (laughs) There we go. (laughs) Wonderful. Did she then go on the Florida one and go, where are all my princess friends? What are these Uh, scary dolls here? Absolutely. Yes. And then we had to be like, but they're countries here. I don't <laughs> care about countries. I want fictional characters. <laughs> We're like, there's more culture, I guess. <laughs> they're bigger. I know nothing about culture. <laughs> Princesses. So they're singing It's a Small World. They're going through. And then they come upon Polyphemus in his lair. And they try to sneak up on Polyphemus, who is raging at Grover that it's been two whole days since a satyr came. And Grover is in kind of the same getup from the book. So in the book, it's so different. But one of the things that is similar, at least, is that Grover is captured by Polyphemus. But the way that Grover tricks Polyphemus into not eating him is that Grover is pretending to be his bride. And he's wearing a wedding dress the whole time and speaking in a high-pitched voice. So they don't, like, go the full bride route, but Mm -hmm. they still have, like, a veil. And they do add something, which I think is fun. The giant googly eye, I think, is great. (laughs) I'm here for the giant googly eye. I don't remember. In the book, was Grover pretending to be a Cyclops? Or was he? Okay, he was pretending to be, like, his Cyclops bride. Mm -hmm. And then the thing, and they never explain this at all, but Polyphemus is the same Polyphemus from the Odyssey, right? It's that one, the Odyssey where, you know, he got poked in the eye with the whole I'm nobody thing. Oh, and yeah. they explain that that's the reason why he has bad eyesight. But in the movie, you're just supposed to like take it at face value when no. they show you his eyes and he's like, oh, I can't really see. And then he's like, I'm so hungry. My eyesight's getting worse. Yeah, so, like yeah, they don't explain. <laughs> that's it. It's like, okay. So if he eats, well, then he realized that Grover is not <laughs> that's a That's the first thing to go when you're hungry. Yeah. Your eyesight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For me, it's my chipper attitude. (laughs) I'm just like, where's food? Give me food. But I do like the giant googly eye. 
Then Polyphemus leaves for some reason and our team kind of calls over Grover. As they bring him over, Grover kind of explains like, oh, I, you know, he thinks I'm some sort of like Cyclops maiden or something. And that's supposed to explain the getup and the high-pitched voice and all that kind of stuff. This is the point where Clarice takes out her smartphone mm -hmm. and takes a photo of Grover with the flash on, come on. But <laughs> takes a photo of him. It's like, what? Smartphones are not supposed to be a thing in the Percy Jackson world at all because mm -hmm. I think it's a great just excuse so that they don't use phones and all the books are like five pages long because it's like, we called for help, the end. Yeah. The explanation in the book is that if you use your cell phones, monsters can detect you more easily. And it's one of those things that's like, okay, fine, sure, yeah. Like, John Wick suit's bulletproof. Okay, yeah, sure, fine, cool. <laughs> Let's roll with it. Like, yeah, it makes for a better movie. It makes for a better book. But she just has a phone. They've never used the phone. They never mentioned phones. There's no phones in the first movie. There's no phones at all mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And then she has it just to take just a picture of him. Ridiculous. Yep. Absolutely ridiculous. So he says something about the get up and he says, oh, like I'm showing my survival skills here. And then Clarice goes, and a small amount of leg. <laughs> so then Polyphemus says that he had to eat his own sheep. In the book, does he? He doesn't no, eat his own sheep, he right? he doesn't eat his own sheep. Right. No. He just like cares for the sheep and they are like demon flesh eating sheep. Yeah. But he, he like cares about them and they're like his pets. So it's super weird that in this movie, they've just decided that he has to eat his own sheep. I don't, I just don't. They didn't have a budget for an animal department. So oh, they couldn't oh, yeah, get yeah, the yeah. sheep in. No, right. <laughs> but it's just, it's just one of those things where it's like, you don't need to include this line in the movie. So why would you do it just to make any fan, like I'm sure you watching, you didn't get bothered by it. Like, <laughs> wait a second, I know the polyphemous myth. But like, if you're trying to do this reference, all you're going to do is make a fan who knows what actually happened more upset. So like, yeah. why add this into the movie? They're so hungry for Easter eggs. I don't know who approved anything in this movie. I don't know, man. I don't know. So Polyphemus <laughs> says this thing about trying to eat his own sheep. And then this is when Clarice has her master plan to try to hook away the fleece. <laughs> like she's in a Tom and Jerry episode. <laughs> So the best plan that they can come up with is stick a big hook. And of course, it doesn't work. He can immediately tell that they're half-bloods because he thought he smelled them before. And then he turns around and sees them. I guess his eyesight is working now. Tyson tries to talk him down, Cyclops to Cyclops. Polyphemus calls him a traitor to his own kind. And Tyson's like, oh, Percy's my kind. And then at that moment, Percy, you know, snags the fleece away. But then he gets hit hard by Polyphemus and slams into a wall. Percy tosses it to Annabeth. Annabeth tosses it to Clarice. She tosses it back to Percy. Then Grover, I guess to distract Polyphemus, runs out and then rips off all of his disguises and says, I quit. And then Polyphemus goes, <laughs> wait, you're a dude? That explains a lot, which I guess is a joke. <laughs> and then our team escapes and they are able to get Polyphemus stuck behind a rock, which doesn't seem to make too much sense because on the other end of the rock, they're just like in the open air. Mm -hmm. So Polyphemus could have just like gone around, right? Know. Unless this is the only entrance. I'm not sure of the exact layout. Of, I don't know the floor plan of the cave, <laughs> but it feels like he didn't have to stay where he was. He needs to go back up through the ride. To get uh, yeah, yeah the I guess, way. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you think he wrote that down? I don't know. <laughs> they said like there's a big hole on the outside of it. But then there doesn't seem to be any other holes on the inside of it. So maybe he like very carefully ducked his way around the tracks and stuff <laughs> to make his way down. I don't know. But they get him stuck behind a rock. And then when they think the coast is clear and everything is safe, they come upon Luke and the Demi Titans waiting for them. Dun, dun, dun. And that's where we'll take a break for intermission. Wah! So... <laughs> Let's all say goodbye to the podcast people as they hear the sea of sponsors mid-roll breaks. Let's all say goodbye, podcast people. Goodbye, goodbye podcast people. Hello and welcome to the sea of sponsors, the final sea of sponsors until season two happens. What a time. But this is technically North Carolina edition. I'm recording this before I leave for tour, but the episode will be live on Monday and I will still be in North Carolina before I fly home. But I do want to thank anyone who came to the sold out Raleigh show and the very well attended Charlotte show and anyone who watched the stream, which you can still watch. So we streamed last night's live show where 
where we kicked off our coverage of Heroes of Olympus, doing the first two chapters with Michael Hollis. And you can watch the seven-day replay of the stream. You can still get tickets if you go to the newsolympian.com slash live. So if you still want to see it, it's within that seven-day replay window. You can get tickets. Just head on over to the newsolympian.com slash live, click the link, and then boom, you're good to go. But it's a multi-camera setup and it'll be the whole live show. So the TNO portion where we cover the first two chapters of Heroes of Olympus and then the Potterless portion where we are going to do an improvised version of Big Brother with Harry Potter pets battling it out. Should be a very fun, silly time. So if you just can't wait to listen to my thoughts on Heroes of Olympus, you don't have to. You can watch that replay. You also can go to the Patreon because over on Patreon, I did a little bonus episode where I read the first couple of pages of chapter one. So if you want those real genuine first time Mike read the words thoughts, you can hear them by joining the Super God tier and above on Patreon. That is where you get access to bonus episodes that I post every single month. Other updates that we've got going on, the Camp Regular Person shirts are back in stock, so we've got a whole bunch of merch back in stock over at thenewsolympian.com slash merch, including the beads and the pens and pins and so much more. And just another reminder that if you want to see the stream where me and a bunch of other Percy Jackson podcasters and guests from TNO watched the Sea of Monsters movie live and you got our genuine reactions to it, you can check that out on the TNO Patreon. If you join at any of the TNO tiers, you can watch the Stream of Monsters replay. And speaking of the Patreon, I want to give a shout out to the folks who have joined most recently. So shout out to our newest Ultra God Tier patron, Finlay McLeod. Shout out to our newest Super God Tier patron, Summer Medema. Shout out to our newest God Tier patrons, Emma Sprite, Nathan Shiflet, Amy, and Samantha. And shout out to our newest Demi God Tier patrons, Jordan, Sonia Ray, Cytosine, Rika, Emily, Eleanor Davis, and Brianna. And shout out to Sarah Elise Arntzen, who upgraded their pledge. Thank you all so much for your support. May Hermes bless you that whenever you are flying, you actually have your boarding pass ready to go whenever it needs to be scanned and you don't have to do the whole like, oh, wait, it was just my phone. I'm so sorry. Blah, blah, blah. He's the god of travelers. Hopefully he can help you out. Now, if you're all caught up on the new Olympian and you're looking for a new podcast to listen to, you are in luck because I think you will like some of the other shows that I make. I'm an independent podcast boy. I make a whole bunch of other podcasts and I think you will enjoy them. And one of the ones I think you might enjoy is Potterless. Potterless was my main foray into podcasting I did before the New Olympian. It was a similar concept where I hadn't read the books before, but it was about the Harry Potter books instead of the Percy Jackson books. And not only do you get to see the growth of me slowly learning about the series, you also get to see the growth of me slowly figuring out how to be a professional podcaster. It goes from a hobby to a side job to the full-time job, and I get better and better at it. So if you want to see the growth of me from recording in a very echoey room in Houston to this, you can track that with Potterless by going to potterlesspodcast.com or searching for Potterless wherever you get your podcasts. Now, unless you're listening on Patreon where you get ad-free and early episodes, you will now hear some ads that make it feasible for me to be a full-time podcaster. Some of them will be read by me, such as one for our new sponsor, Pretty Litter. Others of them won't be. The ones that aren't read by me are inserted locally. So if you live in North Carolina, don't be surprised if you hear an ad for Duke and UNC's basketball game. I guess you should be surprised because that did take place on the Saturday of the Raleigh show, which is hilarious that my nerd podcast would be at the same time. But maybe you'll hear an ad about a local university in North Carolina. But once those ads are complete, we'll get back to this episode of The Newest Olympian. Hope you all had a very good intermission. I missed you all so dearly. Let's talk about the climax of the film. (laughs) So we have... Our team meeting up with Luke, and Luke demands that they hand the fleece over to him. Percy respectfully declines. So then Luke (laughs) pulls out his trademark weapon that we all know and love, and he's been using throughout the whole series, and it's very sentimental. His Gatling crossbow? (laughs) Luke has a sword that he actually uses in the books called Backbiter, and it's part metal and part celestial bronze so it can attack humans and mythical creatures and it's this whole thing and it's evil and it's actually important but no he just has like a fancy like nerf gun looking (laughs) crossbow in this movie (laughs) so he decides to fire that at percy and tyson jumps in front of percy to take the dart in the chest he turns to Percy and says, you do it for me, which is a lie. And then Total lie. he falls very, 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 very deep into some water. And then Annabeth sheds a single <laughs> tear. Which she, is like a big moment for her. She, I mean, the growth from like 
10 minutes ago to now. Uh (laughs) She does explain later on why she had this rush of emotion, so we'll get to that, but I was absolutely flabbergasted when I saw this. Luke then gets our whole team tied up, not very securely. Like, they're tied (laughs) up, but it looks quite loose and not very binding. But that's, like, on brand for any villain tying anyone up, I feel like. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So he has them all tied up. The manticore is snarling at them, and Luke says, down boy, which is funny because in the books, the manticore is like a guy that can turn into the monster. (laughs) So it's just weird that in this movie, it's just a dog. But (laughs) Percy then, after Luke and the manticore leave, says that he regrets not calling Tyson his brother. And he says, I bet the Oracle was right. I'm destined to destroy Olympus because I just gave the fleece away to Luke. And then Annabeth, who would never say this in the books, says, screw the oracle, and encourages (laughs) Percy to write a new destiny for himself. Annabeth in the books is always like hyper fixated on the prophecies and Mm -hmm. really trying to read between the lines. So for her to say, screw it, do whatever you want, is incredibly (laughs) out of character. She says that Percy needs to make sure that Tyson didn't die for nothing. And then Clarice agrees, which also would never happen. (laughs) Grover says, we're behind you. And Percy says, who voted me leader? And then they all raise their hands. Luke then puts the fleece on the sarcophagus of Kronos, and he bids for him to rise. There is no body inside, though. Uh, This is a key thing that happens in the book, is that as the series goes on, I won't spoil it in case you read it, but like there is a person who has to become the new host of Kronos because in the myth he got cut up into a bunch of pieces and then his soul is still around but they need to put his soul back into a body but I guess very Voldemort of yeah okay. <laughs> but I guess in this one there it's just like filled with a bunch of rocks because when Kronos comes back he's just like a bunch of rocks that take a humanoid <laughs> yeah. shape so I guess it's just a bunch of rocks inside but he bids for Kronos to rise Percy then gets Riptide out of his pocket and in the most unhinged way possible, cuts Grover's ropes free rather than click open the sword and then have Grover reach his hand out and then, you know, saw them open like instead Grover just holds his hands out and then Percy hopes he doesn't slice Grover's (laughs) hands off and then opens the sword. It is wild. What a choice. What a choice. So they do that. The sword then glimmers extra orange to foreshadow that it's the Cursed Blade, even though it's not. I won't tell you what the Cursed Blade is, again, in case you read it, but Riptide, not the Cursed Blade. There's a whole different Cursed Blade (laughs) for different reasons. Is Riptide the name of the sword? Yes. Oh, I guess they never say that. Do they even say it in the first movie? I don't know. I don't know that they ever do. It's the name of the sword. It's the name of the sword. It's also called Anaclusmos, which is potentially the Greek word for Riptide, and that's why they call it Riptide, maybe? This guy in the front row's nodding, yeah. (laughs) But yeah, it's like a thing. It's almost like a character. It's not like Riptide talks or anything, but it's, you know, (laughs) Percy's weapon that he uses all the time, and it helps him out of so many situations that you feel a kinship to Riptide. But what if it did talk? It would be fun. (laughs) Like the map in Dora or something like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Encouraging him along the way. Percy, maybe unclip me first before you cut off the ropes. (laughs) So... It's really foreshadowing that it's the Cursed Blade, even though it's not. And then our team begins to fight off the Demi-Titans. Luke has no weapon at all. Percy has a big sword, runs Wait, up to him. what happened to the crossbow? Yeah. Oh, crossbow I don't know. He's just there. Huh. I guess he had to put it down to put the fleece on. I guess. But <laughs> Percy runs up with the sword, and then Luke just kind of, like, slaps him. And then <laughs> Percy, like, the sword goes flying. Like, a reptile just goes flying, and then they just get into a fist fight. It's like, God, come on, Purse. You got to be able to put this together. Then Luke has Percy strangled at one point. He goes, I know you can breathe underwater, Jackson, but can you breathe like this? Which I guess is intimidating. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Luke then grabs a riptide and is about to stab Percy, but then Tyson comes in and saves the day. From the dead. Yeah. (laughs) Percy is bewildered, but Tyson explains that because he fell into water, the water healed him because he's a son of Poseidon. Not a thing, not how that necessarily works, but we're going to roll with it. And we're also going to apparently roll with the fact that the water didn't heal the crossbow wound until Tyson opens his shirt and goes, see? (laughs) As it's actively still healing. Exactly. (laughs) Like, he, that's the only point where I guess maybe he took fall damage as well, but it is just wild (laughs) that that would not be healed yet. I guess it's the, 
healing equivalent of like when someone in an action movie comes into a room at exactly the right moment. I guess the magical <laughs> water power was like, oh, we got to wait for just as he's about to show Percy. And then Poseidon's like, go, now heal him. Now, 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 now. Oh, see? <laughs> so he's back. He's okay. Percy hugs him, thanks him, and calls him brother, which is very sweet. But then Kronos forms. Blah. What's fun about Kronos? He's the bad guy like of the whole series. But instead, he's in Sea of Monsters, which is like, Famously, the one book in the series that doesn't truly have Kronos in it. But he's the bad guy so in this none one of this happens in the no. book. No. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> you get the introduction of bringing Kronos back from the dead in this book, but that's all it is and there's other stuff to worry about. Like, Polyphemus is kind of the big bad in mm -hmm. Sea of Monsters, the book. Kronos coming back is a part of it, but he doesn't fully come back until the fifth book, as you would assume. Yeah. But since I guess they knew that this was going to be the last one, they put the main series bad guy in and defeat him in the Sea of Monsters. Well, I don't know if they know it's going to be the last one. They kind of, at the end, don't they leave it open? I guess they weirdly leave it open to where it's like, the same thing might happen, but Thalia yeah. this time yeah, is kind of the end. Rise again. Yeah, like he might just thing. come back and it'll be the same thing. He <laughs> yeah. wants more snacks. Well, at least we know how to defeat him now. Yeah, you, know? you just hit him with the sword. It was really yeah, easy. Yeah, hit him once it's, with the sword and he's gone. He's not hard <laughs> for to a, defeat. For a time. For a time period, he is gone. That's true. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, maybe if they would have done anything to destroy the sarcophagus instead of just leave it there, but... <laughs> Anyway, Kronos forms. Luke introduces himself to Kronos, says, oh, Kronos, it's me, your great-grandson. And Kronos says, my favorite, and then picks him up and eats him. <laughs> Which is, I just, I, I know in the myth <laughs> that Kronos eats the Olympians, but he doesn't do it for fun <laughs> or because he's hungry. He does it in the myths because he is afraid that the gods will grow up and become more powerful than him and they will take over his throne so to get rid of the threat he eats them but in this case he's just like oh luke nom, 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 nom. Yeah. he's acquired he's acquired a taste i guess time. yeah he's like yeah i had those olympians and they were tasty and this is the son of one of them so he must be scrumptious <laughs> Everyone starts running away, except for Percy, who decides to go after him with Riptide, but he is stopped by the Manticore. Kronos then grabs Grover and eats him, because I guess he heard Polyphemus talking about how tasty satyrs were, so he eats Grover. The Manticore is about to get Percy, but Kronos accidentally hits him with his reforming foot because the effect of it is like the feet keep like unforming and reforming and stuff, so rocks are flying all around. Percy then slashes Kronos' leg after this, and part of him goes back into the sarcophagus. And then Kronos goes, the cursed blade. And Percy, in case this wasn't obvious enough, goes, cursed blade shall reap. <laughs> I'm surprised a third person didn't go, that's what the oracle said. And then a fourth person goes, that's the person who was creepy from the attic. Like, so obvious, oh my gosh. Percy says, you wanna know who gave me this sword? The god who killed you in the first place, my father, which is not true all around. Sure. The sword belonged to Hercules and it was given to him by Chiron. So he's just <laughs> double wrong here. Kronos says that his destiny has been written. Percy says that he makes his own destiny. And then he slashes all the way down Kronos and Kronos has been defeated. <laughs> he's so quick. It's yeah. so fast. It he doesn't put up a fight. Mm-hmm. Grover falls from a very, very tall height, but I guess because he lands in grass, he's okay. Luke falls from a similarly tall height, but he falls through and breaks through a tarp and then lands in Polyphemus's lair. And he's already been eaten. Yeah, but I guess it's like the monster Charybdis in the Sea of Monsters where monsters just don't digest what they eat. You just kind of get to <laughs> hang out in the stomach, which... Again, if you're doing this because of the mythology, you're like, oh, well, he ate the Olympians and then Zeus escaped. They only stayed but alive. But he, he never ate Zeus. When he ate the other Olympians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they all escaped. The whole thing is like they were kept alive because they were literal gods and yeah. they didn't yeah, get not half digested. Gods. Right. It's not just that monsters don't digest things they eat. <laughs> so, yeah, Luke is fine. But then because he falls into 
Polyphemus is pit. I guess it's implied that Polyphemus will eat him, but we don't actually see his death in case they make a third movie. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, well, let's make Luke the bad guy again. Because at the end of the first movie, Luke, they just make Luke the bad guy in the first movie. Well, I I picked up on that because like the first time we meet him, I assumed he fake died in the first movie because right. yes. the first time we meet him, he's like, next time you drown someone, make sure they can't swim. Right, it's exactly. Like, well, I <laughs> yeah. don't know if that's how drowning works, <laughs> but okay. Yeah, it's ridiculous. But what's wild about it is that like, Luke is not really the main big bad in the first one. He's not really the main big bad in the second one. But this film franchise has decided to make him the main big bad twice in a row yeah. and then kind of kill him twice in a row. <laughs> they didn't make the third movie, but I'm guessing in the third movie he would just be like, what's up, guys? Like, <laughs> next time you give someone to get eaten by Polyphemus, make sure they're not a demigod who cannot be eaten. <laughs> and then he's just back. <laughs> but he is implied that he maybe could be eaten or maybe not if they're making a third movie. Kronos is now fully back in the sarcophagus. People are still running away. Percy thanks Riptide. Uh, but he says, thanks, Dad, to the sword. And then the sword hums at him because they couldn't <laughs> pay anyone to be the voice actor. I, I think it is one of those things where, like, if you cast someone as something in a movie and then you make a sequel, you can't have someone. Like, I'm sure it's, like, a contractual thing where they couldn't just, like, use someone else without that actor's blessing. So instead of there being any voice at all, it's just like, <laughs> Poseidon. Oh, was Poseidon in the first one? Arguably yeah. too yeah. much. Like. Oh. Cause like what I was getting from this movie was that what's the psych the, the half brother? Tyson. Tyson yeah. was the clear favorite child. Yeah, it, so it is supposed to like that's actually kind of accurate. Like in the first book, Percy is a really tough time because he never really gets to talk to Poseidon just like a little tiny bit. And then Tyson in the beginning of the second book, seems to have more favoritism. And Percy's like, what the heck? Like, I had to go through all this effort for you to say anything to me, and now Tyson just shows up and he's getting all the preferential treatment, and that's, like, part of the thing. But in the first movie, they put a lot of Poseidon in the mix. He's, like, mm-hmm. constantly talking to Percy through, like, a mental telepathy thing. And he shows up a lot, and he talks to him, and he's watching him, and there's all these things going on. But then the second movie, weirdly, like, does it more accurately, but if you... Look at what happened in the first movie. It doesn't track at all. It's yeah. very complex. Yeah. It makes no sense at all. Nope. But I think they just couldn't afford the actor who played Poseidon to come back into the second movie because he was doing very well on Grey's Anatomy as mm-hmm. Dr. Owen Hunt. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but sword hums at him. Annabeth then runs up to Percy very excitedly, but then gets stabbed in the back by the manticore. She's supposed to be the smart one. I don't know how she missed this because she runs up like a good amount and then gets stabbed in the back. So in theory, she ran past the giant manticore <laughs> and then got stabbed in the back by the manticore. She didn't look around. She has no peripheral vision, I assume. And she just gets stabbed in the back. She must be really hungry. I guess. Yeah, her vision's <laughs> really going. <laughs> so Grover and Clarice then defeat the manticore by cutting off its tail. And then it kind of withers into Nosferatu and then becomes a gargoyle and then crumbles. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, we'll go with it. The CGI was horrendous. <laughs> Percy then puts the fleece on Annabeth, trying to will her back to life. She looks super dead. <laughs> like, not doing great at all. The most convincing bit of acting that Alexandra Daddario did in this film. <laughs> but then after you think all hope is lost, it actually works. Oh, Ooh, wow. Yeah. Whoa, wow, yes. a resurrection story. Yeah, we, we loved Annabeth. She wasn't bad at all. <laughs> She comes back to life and then goes, what happened? (laughs) And then Grover says, don't worry about it. (laughs) Why? Like, why? (laughs) Why not? Why not explain it to him? Why not say, oh, you got stabbed by the manticore, but we used the fleece. He doesn't like to talk about it. (laughs) I guess. It's so strange. It's It's so so weird. It's very traumatic for him. (laughs) He's just going to make passive aggressive comments about it for a while. That's how we communicate. (laughs) Two manticores faces. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Annabeth then thanks Tyson for saving Percy and basically explains, when I saw you do that and put yourself in front of the bolt for Percy, that's when I knew you were okay and not vicious. And what did it take? Him sacrificing his life. That is what put her to be like, you know, I think that guy's all right. 
I which, mean, to be fair, they were literally just running from another Cyclops trying to kill them. Sure, but I would assume, and I would hope that for Annabeth, that over the course of this very long journey, mm -hmm. where Tyson is nice the entirety of the journey, and like runs in front of the Colchis bull to save people, and tries to save people along the way, and is able to get them the hippocampus to mm -hmm. ride on across the water, and is really sweet to Percy, and says all these kind things, and tries to help, and sure, he makes some mistakes, but nobody's perfect. He does all these nice things, but only when he jumps in front of the bull. It's not, the, what's frustrating about it is that it's not like she slowly likes Tyson more and more. She just consistently hates him. And then when he sacrifices himself to save Percy's life, then she's like, okay, fine. I think that Annabeth's personality towards Percy, as we were saying, she has different faces and that's it. Her face towards Percy is kind of doe-eyed, love-struck girl. Mm-hmm. That's why she sings the song with him. She like. Wait, <laughs> there's a song. It's that's, a small that's a small world. world song. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I was like, was there a musical number? <laughs> <I missed? laughs> One of the most comical moments when Percy gets crushed in Cronus's hand, and it just cuts to Annabeth. And she goes, "No!" <laughs> and it cuts back again. I think it's comical. She's not doing anything in the fight. Just no. Um, <laughs> she does do literally does nothing, nothing in the fight except die. <laughs> I think that she only likes Tyson because he saved Percy. Yes. Oh, 100%. all she cares about is Percy. Mm. That's it. If he had mm. jumped in front of anybody else, she'd be like, well, oh, that's not good enough. But, yeah. but he jumped in front of Percy. Therefore, now he's okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know. No, I, I think it. that tracks. I think that's valid. But I think that's super valid. Is she the only one that knew that a Cyclops killed Talia? I don't think so. I think she's the only person that decided to hold a grudge against all of... No, because a lot of the other camp shoots dirty looks at Tyson. So maybe they all hate them too. But I mean, I feel like the proper approach is like to be afraid, not angry. Yeah, yeah. correct. And Because yes. like, right. again, we run into another Cyclops that wants to kill them. And like everybody's kind of quiet and, you know, trying not to get noticed by him. It is kind of weird that Tyson is just like, kind of accepted. Yeah, it's a thing that doesn't get explained that he's supposed to be very young, which is why he's small. And okay. he's supposed to be young and naive. But instead, they've made him just like old, but just really nice to a point where he is like naive in that sense. It's also that some of the Cyclopses work for Poseidon. Yes, there are good Cyclopses. There are good okay. Cyclopses. Okay. And exactly. They, they That's work. not presented. Oh, yeah. not at all. Not at all. So they would make Annabeth's Hatred make more sense, but if you've read the books, you know like there are loads and plenty of good Cyclopes right. that help and are friends of yeah. the gods, and like they work in the forges and they defend the ocean mm -hmm. against ocean monsters. And, and stuff the campers like this. all know that they exist, I presume yeah. as well. And so he's not like the first nice Cyclops to exist. I don't know what the difference is. Like if some of them are born of Poseidon and some of them are born of like like a long time no, ago. I don't think it is because. Polyphemus, in the book, there's a whole thing where he talks with Percy about how they yeah. share a father. It's just some turn out evil and some turn out nice. Yeah. So it is weird that Annabeth is like, well, there were some mean Cyclopses, so I'm just going to hate all of them, especially okay. this one who's been nice to us the whole time. Yeah. But if you save Percy, you're in her You're good super graces. cool. So <laughs> then after this, Percy gives Clarice the fleece since it was her quest. And again, they just have so much more chemistry than Percy and Annabeth. They share like such a knowing look. It's like way Clarice? more of a thing. Yeah, Clarice, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They totally yeah. have a thing. Not in the book at all. No, it's like a enemies to lovers thing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be that. Or, I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not supposed, supposed to, to be that. <laughs> that. It's not supposed to be that. It's not supposed to be that. I but, think, it reads but it but like it reads that. as that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. they've decided it's that, but it is not supposed to be that. I was thinking we just let Annabeth, movie Annabeth, die here. That would be good. And then Percy and Clarice get together. Yes, based on this movie. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, based yes. on the movie. <laughs> yeah. Gosh. So. No one dies though. No, I no mean, one dies. Nah, nah, nah. So then, because Percy has given the fleece to Clarice, Cla fleece, she then <laughs> cuts mid gift of fleece, it cuts back to camp, and while Percy was saying, I think you should do the honors, Chiron is saying, I think you should do the honors, and then she places the fleece on Thalia's tree. And it does start to heal the tree, and it works, and the barrier is back, and then we cut to a celebration of sorts, where Tucci, as Mr. D, is chatting with some lady, <laughs> just some woman who's here now, 
people are Which all. Which is so Tooch. It's yeah, classic Tooch. <laughs> classic Tooch. He's talking about wine and everything. So all the campers are super excited. Clarice is getting paraded around. Her and PJ, again, have a very chemistry, like, mm, look at each other. And then Tyson and Percy share nectar. And they say everyone's favorite catchphrase that we all know and love from the books about nectar. If you haven't had, you haven't lived. Nectar in the books is like a healing potion type thing. But they made this, it seem like it was like absinthe. Or yes, something. It's, yeah, it's just booze. It's just they drink it out of fancy glasses and everything. Yeah. It's ridiculous. It's so silly. Percy then to Tyson says, "You don't need these anymore," and removes the sunglasses from him dramatically. So now it's just that thing from '80s movies where it's like, "Girl, don't wear glasses. You're hot now." Ah. <laughs> so. Whack. Oh, gosh. Ali Sheedy looks so much better pre-makeover in Breakfast Club. Anyway, Percy says he doesn't need them anymore. Then we have Percy having a one-on-one -on -one moment with Chiron. And Percy's like, oh, glad that whole prophecy thing is over. And Chiron's like, not so fast. We might make a third movie. <laughs> he tries to say that the prophecy could be vague enough. It could be about someone else. There could be some other children, even though it had a thing explicitly where it talked about people fighting over a fleece, starting all of the things, and Percy and Luke fought over the fleece. So in theory, yes, but in practice, no. Unless you have to have Thalia fight over the fleece with Luke, Later, like it, they have like a preamble that nullifies her being a candidate. Yeah, it's not actually the prophecy in the books either. That whole thing was new. They, it was there different. is a prop, so there is like a prophecy that is this like actually based on a book, or it's, <laughs> as Rick Riordan himself says, he calls the movies loosely inspired by <laughs> my book series, which is great. But yeah, they weirdly, you have like a prophecy basically for each quest, but then there's also the great prophecy, which kind of gets into the whole Kronos and Percy stuff. Mm -hmm. So what they've done in the movies, they've combined like the individual prophecy for the fleece quest with the overarching series long prophecy. And they mm -hmm. just kind of smushed them together and then added in some new things and then changed mythology, as you would know, because they say that it isn't just Zeus who defeated Kronos, it was Zeus and Poseidon and Hades, which isn't true. False. Yeah. Yeah. They were in the stomach. Right. Correct. So. Along with the three sisters. Yes. Correct. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. They, yeah. Oh, they don't get mentioned at all. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> and incorrectly again, because they say something about the eldest god, but that's supposed to be Hestia. Anyway... Chiron is trying to say, oh, no, it could be somebody else. It's not just her, maybe. Oh, what if we make a third one? So then Grover runs up to Percy all out of breath, and he says, oh, Percy, Annabeth was guarding the tree last night, <laughs> and something happened. It's sunset of the next day. <laughs> what have you been doing? Why are we guarding the tree, though? I guess they're trying to make sure it still works, and like they're, maybe they're having a guard there to make sure no one poisons it. Because in the book, what happens is they do bring in someone to guard the tree, but it's a dragon <laughs> instead of just like a cast of people. I guess it's just like a new chore, like, oh, Tuesday the 12th, Annabeth, go watch the tree. <laughs> but I think that they do that in the book. They are protecting the fleece so that nobody takes the fleece away. Yeah, but isn't that the point of Peleus, the dragon? He's guarding they, the fleece. They get him before number three starts. But oh, okay. As but initially. Two is ending, like sure. initially they're like, we oh, need yeah. to do something. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. then at some point in three, they get the dragon to come and sure. do it. That's fine. My bigger concern yeah. is with last night. She's a <laughs> and they're at a party at sunset. I'm pretty sure Annabeth had a little bit too much nectar. Oh, uh, well, if you haven't had, and, you haven't lived. Yeah. And she kind of like passed out on her guard duty. Either, either that or Grover took the most inefficient route to run for <laughs> Percy and spent an entire day trying to find him. That's why he's so out of breath. He's <laughs> yeah. like, I have been all over this camp and I just can't find Percy. <laughs> so then everybody goes to the tree. And Annabeth says, oh, the fleece was more powerful than we thought. And then Thalia, whose leather jacket and jeans also grew with her, is there <laughs> and is perfectly fine. And there's the whole thing where she's like, oh, whoa. And they're like, oh, everybody quick, get her out of there. And they just move the like very bad prop moss. So, like it is not roots or twigs. It's just like very light moss that you would get from like Michael's Arts and Crafts. <laughs> and they just like brush it aside. And then she's like, oh. And then they're, Percy's like, I'm Percy Jackson, son of the sea god. Anyway, uh, <laughs> who are you? And she says, I'm Thalia, daughter of Zeus. And then we get a voiceover from Percy where he goes, another living child of the eldest gods. 
Maybe it wasn't me. Maybe the oracle meant Thalia all along. Could she be our salvation or the cause of our destruction? And when he says that line, we cut back to the sarcophagus, which is still in Cersei land, <laughs> which is bad enough. But to make it worse, it's not even fully covered by the tarp. They brought the tarp back because the tarp is just not there through that whole scene. They put the tarp back on it, but then didn't fully cover it. They did a terrible <laughs> job and then it's there. And then when he says this, it like glows all brightly and you see the rocks kind of move and stuff. And then credits. And that's the end of Percy Jackson, Sea of Monsters. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> It's a movie. It's certainly a movie. Just ridiculous. Now, before we get into Q&A, Megan did come up with a very fun idea that is, I think, kind of like your version of a TED Talk, basically, where you have used your you know, fantastic viewing film <laughs> knowledge to understand <laughs> the deeper meanings within the film. And you've drawn parallels to another iconic film. And why don't you just take it away and we'll have a, a brief slideshow behind us. And for the folks listening at home, I can kind of describe what is seen. Don't worry. <laughs> Megan's got a good way to make it all work well for audio purposes as well. Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, as I was watching this movie, my husband and I both were like, wait a minute. We already know this story. At first, there was only darkness until the mother island emerged. <laughs> For the folks at home, it is the tree goddess from Moana. <laughs> <laughs> Our tale begins with a hero. Percy and Moana. <laughs> Forced to go on an epic quest to obtain a magical object. The fleece and the glowing green orb <laughs> thing from Moana. Uh, that would be the heart of Tefiti. Thank you, thank okay. you. I've only seen Moana once. <laughs> and this object will save their home from dying. Camp Half-Blood and Moana's homeland. And they're the ones who have to go on this quest mainly because of their royal blood. Poseidon. Because Percy's Moana's always dad. like, why me? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, their quest begins with an elderly woman telling the tale <laughs> of said magical object and explaining why it is their destiny. The oracle and the grandmother. <laughs> Our heroes then gather the necessary gear to complete the quest. <laughs> Loose definition of gear, but Grover, and then, <laughs> and then the boat. <laughs> and they also acquire an unwanted stowaway. Tyson and the chicken that should not have been in the film. Hey, I, could do, hey. <laughs> I could do a whole thing about how the chicken shouldn't be there. You already have one cute animal. Why do we need a goofy looking cute animal? <laughs> Silly. And in both movies, the ocean is repeatedly involved in helpful... Helpful ways. We've got Rainbow and then the water helping baby Moana. And also massively unhelpful ways. The Sea of Monsters and then the scary ocean times for Moana. <laughs> Eventually, they journey to the realm of monsters. <laughs> Charybdis and then Germain Clement. <laughs> Where they either almost or definitely get eaten. But they escape with the aid of a demigod frenemy. Clarice and Maui. <laughs> a magical weapon is heavily involved throughout the series. Riptide, specifically Riptide from the second movie where they added a trident onto it. And Maui's hook. <laughs> Eventually, they run into pirates. Ooh. I think a clip from the graphic novel of Percy Jackson, which is fun because the Princess of Drummond is actually a cruise ship and not a yacht, and then the evil pirates from Moana. And they almost or definitely do get killed by a lava monster. Now we have Kronos and the lava monster who do have the exact same eye and mouth shape. <laughs> it is alarmingly similar. <laughs> But in the end, they are able to save the day with the previously mentioned magical object. And in one of these stories, everyone dead is reincarnated at some point or multiple points 
or reincarnated as a plant and then returned to their original half-blood demigod form. That is Megan Stead talk. It's well done. It's really well done. Knocked it out of the park. So that is the end of our discussion of Percy Jackson, Sea of Monsters. That is the end of this episode for now. If you're listening at home, we'll have a quick break and then we'll get into the Q&A. But if you're here live, let's get into the Q&A, shall we? Hey, it's Mike. Before we get into the Q&A, just going to take one more little break. Since this is a longer episode, we'll have another sponsorship segment. Just another reminder, you can watch the stream of Monsters, me and a bunch of friends watching the Percy Jackson stream by joining the Patreon at any tier, scrolling back and finding that watch party that we did of us watching the movie in my apartment. It was a fun time. And now you are going to hear some of those other ads, the locally inserted ones. And once those are complete, we'll get into the very fun Q&A from this show. And that'll be the conclusion of this episode. Some folks sent in a lot of very fun questions. I will go through as many as time allows. So this first one is from Justin. Justin makes the subject line, give us Jalen Brunson back. Never. <laughs> if anyone doesn't listen to Horse, the Dallas Mavericks had a player named Jalen Brunson that they underappreciated. And then the New York Knickerbockers, my favorite team, paid him what people thought at the time was too much money. But now he's very, very good at basketball and he is severely underpaid. And Mavericks fans are sad. <laughs> I'm not sad. <laughs> <laughs> Justin writes, hey, Shubes, along with being a loyal horse boy and TNO listener, I'm also a diehard Mavs fan. I know your dot, 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 lack of love, dot, 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 for Luka Doncic. I mean, I get it, but it still hurts. But I'm curious, if Luka Doncic and Dirk Nowitzki were demigods, who do you think their godly parents would be? So I feel like Dirk would be Apollo because he had a good, like, long-range game, and that feels kind of archery-esque. And then Luka... I don't know. He does like to whine a lot. Which god is the biggest whiner? Which is the whiner? god of wine? Yeah, the, oh, there we go. <laughs> Dionysus. Well done. Well done. Nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> Good. All right. This I next know nothing one. about these people. Glad I could help. <laughs> yeah, you nailed it. This next one is from Becky, who was kind enough to give us blue cookies before the show. I am very excited. And Becky also sent a list of all the ingredients in case we have any allergies. Oh, so cool. thoughtful. <laughs> Hashubs love the pod. Which holiday movie do you think would be the favorite of each of the main Percy Jackson characters? Percy, Annabeth, Grover, Nico, Thalia, and Tyson. So we can all get in on this. You didn't get to meet Nico. He shows up later, but you'll love him when you get there. Clarice likes Die Hard. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> correct. Correct. That's a good choice. Tyson would like just one of the animated ones, like the Rudolph or Frosty. Mm. I feel like he would just love oh, yeah. the sweet things like that. Mm -hmm. Thalia would pick Nightmare Before Christmas, obviously, because she's the punk rock girl. Grover? Hmm. Yeah, Home Alone's yeah, a Christmas okay, yeah, movie. Yeah, I would say Annabeth would like all the hijinks oh, that goes into that. Oh, all the like traps and yeah, stuff? All the traps yeah, that that's pretty set. good. Yeah. And then we need Percy and we need Grover. I'm trying to think if there's any aquatic or nature-based <laughs> Christmas movies for the two of them, or is there any Christmas movie that features a goat? Hmm. There's the movie that I recently made you watch with me. Oh, yeah. Why don't you <laughs> let them know about Annabelle's Wish? Annabelle's Wish. Oh, wow. Yes. One person yeah. is really, two people two, are yeah. really hyped. <laughs> Well, the animals get to talk once a year in yeah. Annabelle's Wish on Christmas. It's about a cow that basically becomes Rudolph. Yeah. Well, it's, what? <laughs> it's 50 minutes long. It's for free on YouTube, and it features, like, five musical numbers. It's, I forgot about the musical It's very, numbers. like, Southern, yeah. though. So it's, like, it's narrated yeah. by a guy who talks um, like this the whole time. So maybe you would all love it in Dallas. <laughs> I was not a fan. But, but once a year on Christmas, Santa comes and gives all the animals the gift of speech, which is why I thought Grover might like yeah, it. Yeah, okay. I like that. He can talk to animals. Sure, uh -huh, sure, sure. Uh -huh. Percy, though? Percy? What's his favorite Christmas movie? I feel like he might just pick – he could just pick a classic. Oh, maybe Muppet's Christmas Carol. I'm just going to pick that because that's my favorite. It's so good. How do you not love it? How do you not love Muppet's Christmas Carol? It's a perfect I think film. he'd like the humor in that. Yeah. I think he would. It's, yeah. got a, it's got a bunch of jokes. He loves jokes. Okay. This one is from Gracie. Gracie in the subject line writes, this is a pro-pigeon question. Hi, Mike. 
There's this musical in the works called Epic the Musical by Jorge Rivera Herranz based on the journey of Odysseus, which Percy completed and faced portions of, that I think you would love. That sounds great. I'm on board. I don't like the word epic, but I'll let it go because it's the actual correct use of epic. (laughs) That being said, if the Percy Jackson characters were Broadway performers, what musical would they be in slash what characters from said musicals? Tyson could be the tall guy from the ensemble cast of Hades Town. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> there's always that one tall there's dude. There's that one tall There's always really, a tall really rip dude. dude. Yeah. yeah, that could be Tyson because he's yeah. supposed to be taller. Um, hmm. <laughs> Other musicals and Broadway shows. I mean, there is a Lightning Thief play that was <laughs> on Broadway. That feels like cheating. Yeah. Um, maybe Grover would be like um, Zazu in... The Lion King. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay, okay. Um, I could see Nico being something from like more of a like a like Sweeney Todd or something because more of like a darker play. Like yeah. I could see him doing something like that. Thalia. Oh, they they did a uh, they did a Green Day musical, right? Thalia could be in the American Idiot one. That feels right up her alley. Yeah, that would be my pick for sure. Okay, this next one is from Sarah. Sarah made the subject line. I came to two Texas shows. That's cool. Anyone else come to any of the other shows? Nice. All right. Are you Sarah? All right. More than just Sarah. Hello, Mike. I was also at the Austin show and got to see you answer the best question ever by choosing every character's favorite HEB products. Get ready for that episode because that question slapped. It was great. What breakfast cereal would each character eat and which is your favorite cereal? Specifically HEB cereals? I think just any. Any I think we can go beyond HEB. But I guess what's everyone's favorite breakfast cereal to start? I would probably, I might pick Lucky Charms. I, I really Lucky do. Charms Lucky, too. I do like Lucky Charms a yeah. lot. What's your favorite, Meg? I don't. I don't really eat cereal, but okay. Frosted Mini Wheats. I like okay, Frosted. yeah, you liked those okay. when you were younger for sure. As far as the characters, though, I guess Percy Captain Crunch feels aquatic enough. <laughs> Sure. I feel like Annabeth would like one of those really boring, like, Kashi Golin things. She's like, well, it has the best nutrition. Total. So total. Please, oh, total. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> With raisins. Yeah. Tyson would like something that I saw recently, which was... I forget what cereal it was. Oh, it was like frosted flakes with marshmallows. And you're just like, I'm sorry. The flakes are already pure sugar. <laughs> We're adding marshmallows? Like, was that necessary? I mean, but that I, is Lucky Charms. I, well, no. Here's the thing about Lucky Charms, yeah, though. Yeah. I've, I've talked about this on a podcast. Lucky Charms is actually healthier than a lot of cereals because the oat brand pieces that aren't the marshmallows are so healthy that it weirdly balances out to where there's less sugar in a bowl of Lucky Charms than there is in a bowl of Honey Nut Cheerios. Yeah. 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 Lucky Charms is wildly one of the more healthy the cereals you can eat. not frosted? The no, they're not. Nope, they make not, frosted they Lucky regular. Charms, which does feel like a mistake. <laughs> but standard issue Lucky Charms are weirdly healthy because also as time has gone on, they I mean, on, I, think, I feel reduced, like you're l- using the word healthy pretty loosely. By, oh, it's by comparison. No <laughs> cereal is good for you. <laughs> None of it is. But yeah, I feel like that, that covers that pretty well. Um, let's see. This next one is from AB, subject line Dallas slash Bucky's. Hi, this is <laughs> Augie and Ale. Did I say those right? Allie. Allie. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Augie and Allie. Big fans, big fans, straight 10 out of 10 podcast. Our question is, what do you think each character would get from Bucky's? Thanks for the great night. So. Oh, I don't know Bucky's well enough. I don't know it super well because I'm a grumpy Northeastern boy that's like, Wawa is great. It's Bucky's, but it's every five <laughs> minutes instead of every 136 miles. But it's different. It's different. As a Wawa lover, uh-huh. I also appreciate Bucky's, and they are different. I think, yeah. But- I mean, the first time Travis took me, he was like, look, you can order on this TV screen just like Wawa. And I'm like, no, it's not the same. Mm-mm. I appreciate. Like no, no. But they do have like a million different kinds of jerky and they yeah. have kolaches and they have They do have some good food. What other I, things like it's it's kind of like Wawa in the fact that they have their own brand of things. Right. But it's also not Wawa the because thing, it has like a whole store of kitschy things yeah. that you can mm-hmm. get. And like, Wawa, I just recently learned Wawa does have merch and it's great. Their merch is you so You didn't good. know Wawa had I didn't merch. know they had an online merch store. They have an online uh-huh. store where you can get merch, and their sweaters are so good, and they're all out of my size. I was crushed. Just go. You should just. They sell I sh- them yeah, at, I like, should. the bigger store. Yeah, I should. So you got to, like, drive into the suburbs of one that has, like, a gas station Step attached. one, I'll need to get a car. But 
<laughs> take take a train. Take a zip car. To, <laughs> to, to Wawa just to make a merch run. Yeah. One thing I do know that Bucky's has is those those Bucky's tie dye shirts. Yeah. Oh. And I think maybe Grover. Grover would love would that. Would love yeah. a Bucky's yeah. tie dye. Tyson shirt. would love beaver nuggets for sure. He would be all over those. <laughs> yeah. Which, the other thing we know which exists. Which yeah. our mother Barbara does keep joking that she wants beaver no, nuggets. Travis got her some. Did she actually eat one? I don't think so. I don't know because like <laughs> I think the bu- the bags of and the if f- she did she would have spit it out. Exactly. That's the thing. The bags of beaver nuggets. The smallest bag is huge. Barbara would eat one and be like, oh, God, that was so sweet. <laughs> like when we gave Aunt Judy a Fruit Loop, a singular Fruit Loop, and she spit it out. In her defense, Fruit Loops, in, are gross. Are, they're gross in America. But Fruit Loops abroad are fantastic. We had Fruit Loops in Australia, and they actually make them with, like, mm-hmm. fruit juice because other countries are like, this is so unhealthy. <laughs> fruit Loops in Australia, phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. And they're also, like, not bright neon. They're, like, regular human colors. Yeah. So they're really good. Yeah, the one thing that, about Bucky's that does bug me though is they like they like to brag about the bathrooms, and it's like yes, they are clean. That is nice. Do we need sixty stalls? Uh, I've it, been in where they've all been I, taken. Okay, maybe Absolutely. I'm maybe I'm going to the wrong Bucky's. <laughs> Absolutely. But I've never been into one where it's full. It's like I feel like if you guys took away a little bit of the bathroom budget, you could make more Bucky's so that they aren't 136 miles no, apart. <laughs> they're they're making them all over. There's I two so. on the way from Dallas to Houston We now. were just on the drive from here when we were going from San Antonio because we did the show there last night to here. Mm-hmm. I, I keep saying 136 because we did pass a billboard. Once you pass a Bucky's that goes, the next one's in 136 miles, <laughs> which just feels like too far. <laughs> but that, that's the point. It's like a destination. But like... But that's what I love about Wawa is you don't have to go out of your way. It's just there. And that's why yeah. it's different. But, they're not but the I, same. But I, sure. They're not the but same. But things can be different and one can be worse. <laughs> like, that's what I'm trying to say. No, you're, you're comparing apples to oranges. Yeah, like, but well, no, I'm comparing is... apples that cost a dollar to apples that cost $10. No, you're like, no, they're no, rarer. No, so. no. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking when we passed the sign that said 136 miles to the next Bucky's, I was like, Gosh, I hope I'm not still here for the next month. <laughs> I hope we've made it. Oh, man. So this uh, next one is, again, from Becky. Becky says, hello again, another question. If they decide to not have Grover play Hillary Duff, what Taylor Swift song would you like to see Grover play on his pan flute in the TV show? So legally, I cannot spoil it, but I will let you know that he does not play Hillary Duff, but what they replace it with is amazing. <laughs> I'll just leave that be because I'm not can supposed you to talk. Just what? I've I I I got press access to the first four episodes and yeah. there's like embargoes of where you're not supposed to like say any spoilers. No, but what until... is the Hillary Duff? Oh, oh right. Oh, yeah, oh, right. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh gosh. So in the first book, Grover <laughs> And throughout the series, he has magical reed pipes. And at first, it's like this cute little thing where they're going on a quest and he plays the reed pipes because it's it's very much like a satyr pan thing. And in the first book, when they're just trying to like pass some time, he starts playing some like classical music song. And then Percy's like, do you know anything else? And then he plays So Yesterday by Hilary Duff, (laughs) which is fantastic. (laughs) It's so funny. I I forgot she was a singer. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. So he plays that song, and it's so good. And then doesn't he also play a Jesse McCartney song later on in the series? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and these books came out in, like, the mid-2000s when they were at their peak, so it's so funny. It's so good. And in the TV show, they do something instead of that that's of the same vein. Got but you. what mm-hmm. Becky's asking here is, if Grover wasn't playing Hillary Duff, if he was playing Taylor Swift, what song do you think that he would play? Kaylee, or Kelly, you are our resident Taylor. I had combined Taylor and Kelly into Kaylee. Ooh, I'm honored. <laughs> Kelly, you are a resident Taylor Swift expert. What would be the Grover selection? I mean, is that... You can take it however you want. I, yeah, I guess I'm deciding how to take it. Is it the most popular song? Or is it the song that gets stuck in your head the most? It's the only song, right? The only song. Does Hillary Duff have other songs? Oh, oh yes. she's got oh. many out. Let the rain fall down. <laughs> oh, she has so much work. I'm coming clean. Hey now, in parentheses, hey now, this is what dreams are made of. <laughs> she has a whole album. She's got a whole album so where Haley sings half of the vocals. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she has an album that came out around the same time that she was in a non Disney movie. Oh, and, and there's she- also Why Not? Well, yeah, yeah. That was Why not? Take a second, crazy. <laughs> oh, so Why much Hillary 
duff. Do oh, a crazy yeah. dance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Love the duff. Yeah. <laughs> For Taylor, I would my vote would be shake it off. That's what I was gonna okay, say too. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was it gonna say. It feels like in the same vein of So Yesterday is like one of the most popular, if not the most popular. But then yeah. also when So Yesterday does get played, it's when they're trying to like take their mind off of the scariness of the quest. So Shake It Off <laughs> kind of feels in the vein of yeah, sure. leave your troubles behind. Our troubles were so yesterday. Let's take our troubles and shake them off. Sure. Yeah. yeah. That would be <laughs> that would be my selection. <laughs> Okay, we'll do our final question here. It's fantastic. It's from Tabitha, Marissa, and Abby. It says, hi, Mike and Kelly and Megan. This question is for all of you. If you were a mermaid, what would your tails and shells look like? And what water-based powers would you have? Feel free to use multiple colors, patterns, textures, and other details to describe. I think that's a perfect way to end the show. I really wish Aurora could answer I this mean, for yeah. me because she actually has all of this drawn out in yes. her right. notebook that she showed me earlier today. Mm-hmm. I feel like I would go with, hmm. I want to make sure I don't just pick Ariel because what, what's Ariel? She's got green tails She's and green like. green and purple. I would have okay, red right, flowing hair and. <laughs> I just don't want to pick the same things and think I was being cool. No, so I would pick pink shells and then like a glittery navy blue tail because I've always enjoyed like the navy blue pink color combination. I wish more sports teams would do it. None will ever because they're cowards. But. I don't know if you get shells. Yeah, you I, don't need shells. I don't need but them, okay. but I would still like to have them. Okay. <laughs> they won't serve a purpose other than fashion much more. <laughs> so I will do that. <laughs> do I need the Christmas sweater on top of the turtleneck in, in addition to the Santa Claus pants? No, but it looks good. <laughs> I would go with pink shells. I would go with a blue bedazzled bottom. And I think I would go... Hmm. Maybe I would go with like a like a pinstripe with like alternating like navy and then maybe like a little bit lighter shimmerier and then my vertical stripes would be nice and slimming for my my fishtail bottom. <laughs> I would have shells made out of a lot of shells because I like to oh, collect shells whenever we okay. go to the beach. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would have a shell made out of a lot of shells. Mm-hmm. And I would have like a mood ring type of tail oh, where it changes oh, color based fun. on my mood. Oh, it actually changes based on your mood and not just like the heat, like what real <laughs> mood rings do. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. Megan, your mermaidness. Okay. I would have a, can I have a sea glass? Yes. Top. Yes. I'm surprised Kelly didn't pick that. So I'm glad you did, but you're also a big sea glass Almost fan, like so yeah. chain mail, like okay. pieced together with like the little jewelry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. I don't know what color tail. I feel like like iridescent something. Mm. But I'm like just envisioning. Anybody ever see Fantasia? Yes. You know, like, you know. So like you the, ask the crowd of okay. nerds if they've ever seen <laughs> Fantasia. <laughs> you know, like the, the nutcracker scene where it's like the fish doing the Arabian mm. and their tails are like just wrapping around them, the veil. That's that's. That's fantastic. Great. Well, thank you for your question. Thank you for the answers. Thank you all for coming out to the show. Thank you so much. This was a blast. Give it up to Megan and Kelly for being fantastic guests. Give it up to Kelly and Barb and Joel for helping out at the merch table and other behind the scenes things. And give it up to everyone here at Deep Ellum Art Company for putting this all together, for Sky running the set, the tech and the sound. All of that was wonderful. I really appreciate it. Thank you all so much for coming out. I hope to return to do another show in the future, and maybe we'll cover something a little more fun than the crap movie that we all covered. But until we cross paths again, and when I make my way back, maybe under better circumstances. Until then. Thanks so much for coming out, everybody. Hello! Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Newest Olympian. This podcast is created, hosted, and produced by me, Mike Schuber. I also run the social media and the website. Our editor is Sherry Guo. The music is by Bettina Campamanas and Brandon Grugel. And the art is by Jessica E. Boyd. If you can't get enough of the show, you can find us on social media. We're at Newest Olympian on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And we're on Reddit as well, reddit.com slash r slash The Newest Olympian. And if you really can't get enough of the show, you can check out the bonus content for the podcast at thenewestolympian.com slash Patreon. There's a bunch of bonus content you can get exclusive 
exclusive merchandise, lots of fun stuff there. And if you want other merchandise, you can go to our merch store, thenewestolympian.com slash merch. I mentioned the Patreon, so let's give a shout out to our producer level patrons, Kelsey Gillespie, The Damn Steam Nuggets, Vicky Garcia, Ellie Haskovchova, Veronica Bartova, Frida Vikstrom, Megan Moon, Craig McRoberts, Taylor Payne, Sabrina Balsiger, Bony Pony, Polly Burge, Nikki Harris, Tatiana Schmidt, Sandra Rose, Josh Sayer, Josh Wilkie, Abby Ryan, Ashton Gabrielson, Marco Redhouse, Sam Sam Reby, Riley Kiddas, Mary Kelly, Mrs. O'Leary, Milo Kim, CC Reads 23, Sankoff, Julia Kendall, Ricky, John Drillsma, Rayla Matthews, Riley Draken, Luna Kadoon, Sky Mallory, Per Sassabeth, Aiden Parziani, Biggest Tyson Fan, Hunter Landstrom, Captain Jack Rackham, King Bastion, One Damn Distraction Coming Up, Ginger Spurs Boy, A Cup of Solace, Meg Roy, Lux, Neil, Olivia Krinicki, Mrs. O'Leary is Best Doggo, Bradham is Prime, Kipo Guy, McKenna Finley, Skylar Sisters, Demigod Nurse, Zachary Hamilton, Scott Sheldon, Sophie, Natanya Page, and M. Thayer Cohen, and Finley McLeod. If you want to help out the show in a non monetary way, just talk about the podcast, whether that is posting about it on social media or reaching out to someone that you think would like the show, or just leaving us a rating and review on whatever podcasting app you are using. All of those things help. Spreading the show's existence via word of mouth is essential for the podcast, so I'm very appreciative to anyone who has done that in the past or will do it in the future. But I'm just so thankful that you tuned into this episode, and I hope you tune into our next episode, which will be a special interview episode to kick off our coverage of the Lightning Thief musical, where I will be chatting with Chris McCarroll, who played Percy in the Lightning Thief musical. But until then, I'll Percy you later. Hey, everyone, how's it going? It's me, Asa Marmik. So here in the Shubio, I have a lot of different things on the walls, whether that's things people have given me at live shows or things that people have sent to the P.O. box. I have it decorated with a bunch of fun things from listeners, and it makes me really happy. And one thing that I have is a Polaroid picture of a dog that supported my Potterless podcast. And seeing this Polaroid picture, I was thinking of what I could do for the audio, and I was thinking I could shake it like a Polaroid picture to pay homage to Outcast. So here I am shaking a Polaroid picture like a Polaroid picture. Really not as wobbly as I thought it would be. You heard a little crinkle and then maybe the wind in the microphone, or maybe it was just completely silent. Uh, just in case, I'll rub the Polaroid picture on the microphone. Thank you for listening.